We are live. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome back to uh, Ask the Agronomist. We're uh, south of Macomb today at the uh, uh, Nutrien facility. Appreciate them letting us use our, uh, our their conference room and their internet for our broadcast here this morning. Another uh, miserably wet, uh, crappy spring day here in West Central Illinois. Adam and I were looking at some uh, climate uh, rainfall reports and in his territory. He was showing between three and seven tenths yesterday. I had about an inch and a half at, at my house. So it's uh, around, around home. We're up to um, about three, approaching three and a half inches uh, for the month of March. So uh, it has uh, turned into a wet March here recently. And uh, a few days ago, there were, uh, it was looking like we were not too far away from getting into the field. And, and right now, it, uh, it looks like it'll be a while. So um, we're, uh, we're going to follow up on a, a few fertility-related items that we touched on um, on our last episode. I uh, have some uh, fungicide updates as a result of, uh, of a couple meetings I was at earlier this week. Had some good questions from some growers that, to uh, be honest with you, I was not prepared to answer um, at, at, the, at, at the live meeting. So I had to do a little research uh, on, uh, on some product labels, and I've got some updates uh, I want to share. And, uh, and as always, hopefully answer your questions. So uh, Producer Adam is with us here today. And and, and uh, glad glad Adam's back with us because uh, I'll, I'll show you this. Uh, the, he's he's having some some uh, in uh, uh, let's see uh, twenty twelve and uh, no, actually twenty ten for the corn data and the soybean data from twenty twelve and twenty thirteen. So w would that have been during your tenure there, Adam? Would yeah, yeah. Would so have. so actually that was that was before we had uh, corrupted Adam. And turned him into an evil bear salesman, and uh, he actually was a uh, was a researcher working on Dr. Belo's uh, crew. He was he was like he wasn't a he wasn't a student worker. He was like a actual worker, um, and uh, spent several years in Dr. Belo's team. And um, so so Adam has a a very strong agronomic background and a lot of the work that Dr. Belo's done around uh, around fertility. So uh, anyway, we're going to we're going to touch on that a little bit. And uh, please chat in your questions in, in the live chat if you have them. Uh, we're uh, we're going to touch on a few things maybe related to spring and planting and uh, replanting and, and some of those type of things. But as always, I would love to get your questions. Got a brand new, brand new whiteboard. Were you going to say something, Adam? Oh, no, no. Go okay. ahead. I, once we get done the introduction, we got a question already. Oh, so. awesome. Good deal. Good deal. So, so we got a brand new whiteboard. This thing has never even been written on. But I'm gonna put uh, I'm gonna put my phone number up here. It's a it's a little it's a little floppy, Adam. So we may <laughs> we may have to secure that a little bit. But uh, I'll put the email up here. If you have questions, send them in. Bear.com. What's our first question, Adam? So our first question comes from Dirt Doc. Oh, Dirt Doc. awesome. He's been a great patron. Of the I know. Yeah. We, really we, appreciate if if it wasn't for him, we could shut this whole show down because uh, <laughs> he keeps us going. Well, we get a lot of people that view this uh, these recordings afterwards, of course, on YouTube, which is awesome. But yep. I really appreciate the people that participate yep. as we're going. So thank you, Dirt Doctor, Do Dirt Doctor, Paul, for all your all your activity and participation. So he's got a great question this morning. We're we're getting ready to plant, and he says, "I know this has been discussed before, but the seeding rate estimator for seven dollar corn gets crazy yeah. high. Yeah, uh, sixty five yeah. ninety five in particular, he yeah. says, is well yeah. over." Yeah. yeah. Standability concerns. You know, should we still be sticking with it? You know, yeah. what's, what's yep. your thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So great question. We get this all the time. And, and I'll be quite honest with you. There's a lot of people in, in my position and probably even more of our sales reps that get uncomfortable with our seating rate recommendations. There's a lot of people out there. There's kind of a kind of an old standard rule of thumb. And I think even Dr. Velo would, would say this. That in a 30 inch row, conventional wisdom is there's really not much benefit of going beyond 38,000, you know, seats per acre is a, is a number that, that a lot of people would say is, is about the max in a 30. Um, you know, our data and, and we've got a lot of data. We, we 
test uh, population that uh, we, we test from 24 to 55,000 currently is the plant, the range that we test. And those are trials planted uh, lots of locations across the Corn Belt. We're up to six or eight years worth of data on 6595. We'd probably have five or six years worth of data. And the population response curve on that hybrid is is crazy high. Um, I don't generally make any recommendations above 40,000 un unless I'm doing a script. And if I'm doing a script uh, in the part of the field that has shown the ability to produce 300 bushel corn, I don't think there's anything wrong with pushing into low into the low 40s in a 30 inch row, assuming that you've got the right fertility program, the right fungicide program, the right harvest plan. You know, the right harvest plan, if you're going to push populations, is to start harvest in the mid to upper 20s on moisture so that you're getting a, a lot of corn out before it gets below 20 percent. Generally, no matter how thick you plant, nothing really bad happens until you get under 20 percent. Uh, but the longer that crop stands out there in the fall. So if, if you're a guy like my dad was, my, my dad wouldn't start till it was 17. Uh, didn't matter what the calendar date was. Didn't matter what the forecast was. Didn't matter. Didn't matter nothing. You know, seventeen was his number. Um, you know, you you can't plant forty four thousand and and wait till it's seventeen to to start harvest. But if you're willing to push it at harvest and and willing to manage your fungicide, you've got good fertility and you're and you're executing a script and that script is based on good yield data. Uh, I, I think it's okay to to push it. The way I use our population data is to to gauge relative differences between products. So so I'm not making a lot of recommendations for 6595 planted at 44,000 regardless of, of what the the uh, the population generator says. but I, I do recommend that if it's coming out at 44,000 and another hybrids recommended at 40, um, you, you know that one of those should be planted thicker than the other one. And, and you may dial them both back. And we've created, you know, in, in our script generating tools, there's a really easy way to dial that population back. So if you think we're smoking dope and there's no way that that's the right population, you can dial it back and it will proportionately change that script across the field. So if you're comfortable with your maximum being 40, um, you can dial it back until the maximum is 40, and then that's going to readjust everything else in the field. So <clears throat> my recommendations on populations is, you know, get as close to the recommended population as you're comfortable with. Do some experiments. You know, if the thickest you've ever planted corn is 38 and the script is telling you to plant it at 42 and you can't get to 42, but you can get to 40, then then do 40. Um, you know, put some learning blocks out in the field, you know, experiment really easy these days to, to change the population on the go on the planter. You can map that, you can harvest that, you can, you know, put a static strip of 34 right through the middle of your script that's varying from 29 to 44 and, and make those comparisons easily. So <clears throat> I, I do think that we have to use some common sense and we have to at times uh, make some adjustments. Um, you know, most of our pop, you know, our population trials are, are done by the breeding group. They are small plot trials. We do rate standability on those trials. Um, they don't harvest them all at 36%. So, I mean, it's, it's as real world as we can make small plots, but they are still small plots. And, and in small plots, you can have effects from alleys. You can have effects from, you know, adjacent hybrids. I mean, a uh, a small plot isn't necessarily like having, you know, 80 acres of corn at 48,000. It's, it's different. So uh, I, I do think you have to, um, to, to use some common sense. And, and if it's telling you to do something that you don't think is right, you know, then I would say go, go with your gut, uh, go with your experience. But I would say in general, we are all planting hybrids at lower seeding rates than what our data says they should be planted at. And so I would push yourself, you know, maybe you don't push yourself on 2000 acres, but, you know, take a couple fields and, and experiment, push that seeding rate higher. I do think this will be one of the biggest advantages of short corn. It's going to give you the confidence to push population without um, jeopardizing the standability of your crop. 
And, you know, if you've been uncomfortable, you know, pushing seeding rates with, with standard corn, uh, short corn is going to give you the ability to do that more safely, more securely, be able to sleep at night. Now, one thing I've asked our research group to, to, to start to figure out is if, uh, if standard corn um, has this level of risk at 36,000, and at 36,000, short corn has this level of risk of, of going down. You know, at what population in short corn do you have the same level of risk? Is it 40? Is it 44? Is it 48? Is it 50? I don't know that we know the answer to that. We, we know that if you plant short corn at 36,000, stock lodging virtually goes away. Um, my guess is at some population, you know, it's going to be well up in the 40s, I'm guessing. You know, short corn at 44,000 might have the same risk of lodging as standard corn at 36,000. You know, I don't know what that ratio is, so we got work to do on that yet. But I, I know what we're going to do. We're going to push for higher yield because that's what we're going to do. And we're going to find out how far, you know, if, if this is your level of risk that you're comfortable with, how high can you go with a seeding rate in short corn and not exceed that level of risk? So hopefully that addresses uh, Dirt Dr. Full's great opening morning question. <clears throat> and uh, in, the, uh, in, in the absence of more questions, we'll, we'll jump right into some of this, um, um, some of this nutrient data. I'm going to stand up here and write a few things down here real quick. So, so Adam, why don't, why don't you tell us, uh, and, and speak up because the microphone's over here. So, so why don't you tell us how this, how this data that I'm going to put up here on the board was generated and, and don't like have flashbacks or, or start <laughs> twitching or, or anything. I'll but. try to keep my PTSD at bay. <laughs> that's right. That's from, right. From, from those days. So. Yeah. Yeah, uh, this this information is derived from Dr. Fred Bilo's work over at uh, University of Illinois Crop Physiology Lab. I spent uh, about eleven years over there as as a student worker and also a worker. As uh, Lance yeah, mentioned I earlier, miss, I misspoke there. Yeah, no, all good, all good. But had a lot of great experiences and learned a lot of stuff uh, working with Dr. Bilo, and he does a great job of doing a lot of practical hands on. Uh, information gathering and, and this nutrient uptake and removal information is really really interesting work that we did but I can tell you it's uh, it's not as much fun actually figuring out how to get these numbers um, you actually have to go out there and sample thousands and thousands of plants throughout the season throughout different growing points throughout the season to see uh, how these uptake patterns change throughout the year and obviously overall at the end of the year so you have to you have to sample the entire plant, and then you have to break the plant down by the different components of the plant. Whether you're looking at reproductive organs, whether you're looking at stover, whether you're looking at you know of the stover, whether you're looking at the leaves, or you're looking at the stock. So you know there's a ton to learn, but it is quite the intensive process, Lance, to uh, to do all that. As a matter of fact, funny story when I first started, uh, Fred Fred was out there sampling plants like. I mean, unbelievable the amount of plants we were sampling, the amount of plants that he personally sampled, and he, he finally passed the torch. Fred is a high energy dude. Oh, if you've great. ever spent any time with Fred. Ne never a dull moment with Dr. Bilo, no doubt about it. And he was he finally passed the torch to me to start uh, start sampling plants, and he was using about a 10-inch knife to cut the plants at the base of the mm -hmm. corn plant. Mm -hmm. And I said, this isn't going to work for me, Fred. I said, I need something a little longer. So I showed up with something that was called machete, but it looked more like a sword. And that's how we started sampling all these plants from then on. Yeah. You had to pass a few safety exams yeah. and things yeah. like that to operate it. Do Dr. Bilo is a little closer to the base of the plant than you and he I, is, and, and he, he doesn't is. have this belly to work around <laughs> either. So, <clears throat> Okay, so I, I got two columns of data up here on the board. Hopefully you can see that. I may have to have Adam do a little camera work for me. So this is for a 260 bushel corn crop. And, and this goes back to a question that um, another one of our good listeners asked two weeks ago was what, what is the nutrient uptake? I think his question was specific to boron and zinc, and, and we'll get to that here in a minute. But we'll start with the biggies up here at the top. So there's two columns of data. The smaller numbers over on the right would be the removal in the grain. So that's how much nitrogen 
phosphor, or, uh, potass or phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, uh, is removed with the grain. Now that's pounds of nutrient, not pounds of fertilizer or pounds of element, not pounds of fertilizer. So you notice this is P2O5. So P2O5 is the phosphorus component of MAP or DAP, but the concentration of that component is 46% in DAP and 52% in MAP. So if you want to calculate how many pounds of fertilizer are being removed, you would divide 90 by 46, 0.46 in the case of phosphorus. So that number would more than double. <clears throat> this column is, is important as well because that's the total uptake in the plant. So as Adam was describing the painful process of calculating uptake, that is how much nutrient is in the leaves, the grain, the cob, the stalk, even the roots of that corn plant. And that plant has to have access to that much nutrient through the growing season. Now, it's not going to take it all up immediately. It's going to take that up through the whole growing season. It takes up most of that during the rapid growth phase of its life. And a lot of what ends up in the grain is actually remobilized out of the plant later in the season. <clears throat> but you can see there's a ton of potassium in the plant. That's why corn so often shows potassium deficiency because it's having a hard time finding what it needs. There's relatively little of that that ends up in the grain at the end. So most of the potassium taken up by the corn plant is recycled back into the field through the stover and is still there for the following year's you know, crops to utilize. So it removes a lot more phosphorus, takes up a lot more potassium. You look at sulfur, so, so it's going to take up about 26 pounds of sulfur. Again, that's not 26 pounds of fertilizer. Question? I, I, we got a question and yeah. another thing, too. I would probably write up there, Lance, like total plant maybe and remove with the grain. Yeah. So when yeah. people are going back yeah. and referencing, yeah. you know, that, that on the right, that's grain removal. Okay. And then on the left, that's total plant, including yeah. the grain, the, yeah. the leaves, the stock, the reproductive yeah. waters, the whole nine yeah. yards. Good. Good, uh, good call out. And what was the question, Adam? So, so the question comes from Pokemon Champ. Thanks for uh, sending us a question on the live chat. We love that. It says, looking at this data, could you explain why we have different recs for different regions on soil fertility, mm -hmm. i.e. Illinois versus tri-state recs? Okay, so, <clears throat> so some of the differences are based on soil differences. So different soils have different abilities to supply nutrients. So even within Illinois, if you, if you pick up an old U of I agronomy guide, you'll see there are different regions in the state where they're recommending different levels of, you know, fertilizing to different P levels or fertilizing to different K levels. That's based on the parent material of the soil, the CEC of the soil, several different factors. Now, when you get into other states, other universities, other agronomists, other experts, um, you know, I, I joke oftentimes, you know, get eight or 10 agronomists together in a room and try to get them to agree on how to manage nitrogen. Good luck. There is a lot of different philosophies, a lot of different theories, a lot of different opinions on, on the best way to manage nutrients. And so some of the differences like between U of I and, and central tri-states and, and other different regions is just difference in philosophy based on the research that's been done by that particular institution it might relate back to differences in soil, climate, environment. It might just be a difference of opinion, uh, but but that's some of the reasons why you get the the different um, the different recommendations that are out there. So <clears throat> we we need to make sure that you know when you're calculating how much nutrient got removed. So I, I base my fertility program on on removal. So once I get my soil test work close to where I want it. I use my yield data to calculate removal and I put back what I took off. This total uptake column, that's the amount of nutrient that we need to make sure that plant has access to through the growing season. If it can't find that much, it's going to limit its ability to produce yield. And, and these numbers are all relative to this 260 bushel yield. That part of your field that's making 300 is removing way more than even these numbers up here. And, and if you want to do some, you know, do a little quick math up here, Adam, do this for me. What's, uh, what, uh, how many pounds of DAP is 90 units of P205? 
going to be about 190 ish, roughly. Yeah. So I'm going to write down 190 pounds DAP. So, so, so when you're 195.6. Okay. Yeah, 196. So when your corn crop yields 260 bushel, you need to apply 196 pounds of DAP to put back what it took off. So when you're doing that 200 200 spread that you think is a two year fertility program and you raise 260 bushel corn, you just use, you know, two years worth of phosphorus in that one year. And, and that's part of the reason why soybeans so often struggle to achieve their maximum yield potential because we're under fertilizing them. Because if you fertilize every other year and you fertilize ahead of corn, which is kind of the old standard way of doing it, and you don't put on enough and your soil ties some up, there's just not as much left there for, for that two years later bean crop as, as you were intending. Um, any questions coming in, Adam? No, we, okay. we got a, a question. Uh, Eric Curry had a question, but it was about inhibitional chilling and things like that. Oh, so yeah. We'll, yep. We'll get we'll get we'll there get to that. Yep. So <clears throat> so let's uh, let's slide down to the to the micros here. So I may have you tilt uh, tilt my camera, Adam. There you go. Right there. So so the question that was asked two weeks ago was what what is the actual amount of I can't remember if it was zinc or boron. So we'll touch on both of them just to make sure it's covered. So these two, <clears throat> so basically from here up, these are all macros. And, and if you wonder why we call the micros the micros, notice here, you know what OZ stands for? That stands for ounces. All these others are in pounds. So if you want to look at the magnitude of difference between a macronutrient and a micronutrient, the total amount of zinc that a 260, corn, 260 bushel corn crop is going to take out of the soil during the growing season is eight ounces. Now, five ounces of that, which is a pretty high percentage, is going to end up in the grain. So there is a lot of the zinc that the corn plant takes up through the growing season, finds its way into the grain. Boron, even less. So boron, 1.4 ounces is the total amount of, of elemental boron that corn crop's going to take out of the soil. So that's why when we're talking about fertilizing for, you know, micronutrients, we're talking about a, you know, a few pounds per acre or less uh, is, is all we're going to apply. And even when you get a lot of soil tie up and even when it's not a terribly efficient uptake mechanism, um, you know, you don't have to have a lot. So in the case of boron, only a third of an ounce, basically, a boron is going to be contained in 260 bushels of corn. So that's really gives you a good idea of the, the, the difference in scale between the macronutrients and the micronutrients. And, and sulfur is a macro. So I this is one of my pet peeves. In addition to test weight, this would be one of my bigger pet peeves, uh, is people referring to sulfur as a micronutrient. Sulfur is, a, is absolutely a macronutrient. Now, it is <clears throat> it is one of the smaller macronutrients relative to N, P, and K, but you can see the difference between 26 pounds per acre and eight ounces per acre, uh, the, the difference between a small macronutrient and a large micronutrient. So zinc would pro probably be one of the bigger micronutrients. <clears throat> zinc and boron are, are probably two of the more often um, talked about micros when it comes to, when it comes to corn. And we can do all the same stuff for soybeans, <clears throat> and they have. And, and those numbers are, are equally interesting for the, for the sake of time. Um, we probably won't go into as much detail on soybeans, but I do want to show <clears throat> a few things that I think are just interesting. So we'll put the same chart back up on the board. <clears throat> Nitrogen, P205. Just realizing I shouldn't have erased this part of the chart. <laughs> <clears throat> Sulfur. So this is pounds uptake. And Adam is exactly right. Uptake includes the grain. Uptake is total. And this is removal in grain. So oh, hold on to your hats. What do you, what do you think that nitrogen? And this is for a 75 bushel bean crop. Dirt doctor full. You're not even happy with 75. So a lot of you are raising more than 75 bushel beans. <clears throat> what do you think that nitrogen number should be for 75 bushel beans? 
Would you believe it starts with a three? And would you remove? Would you believe the removal rate is over two hundred? B two hundred five is fifty four and forty four. K two O. Look at that one. Two thirteen. 88 sulfur soybeans like sulfur almost as much as corn not much difference honestly between sulfur removal for corn and soybeans how many of you are using sulfur on soybeans and then zinc also not too much different six ounces 2.5 again we're still talking ounces here and boron Boron is quite a bit higher for soybeans than it is for corn because the legumes need more boron and two ounces. So <clears throat> this nitrogen number is, is kind of what blows people's minds. And, and, and another, you know, another kind of myth I, I like to bust is there is no such thing as a soybean credit. And, and this is why. So that soybean crop <clears throat> that you put no nitrogen on in most cases, remove 224 pounds of nitrogen from your soil. So at what point are you returning nitrogen to your soil through soybeans when you remove 224 pounds of nitrogen? You're, you are not. Uh, soybeans leave the soil in a nitrogen deficit situation. The reason we talk about a credit, and it shouldn't be a credit, it should not give Dr. Velo credit for, for, for saying it this way. It's a corn on corn penalty. It is not a soybean credit. Um, so we, we did... I think we did agronomy a disservice when we started talking about a soybean credit. That there is a higher need for nitrogen corn on corn than there is following soybeans in rotation. So that got started talking about as a credit. There actually is, you know, soybeans do not leave extra nitrogen in your soil. Um, but the soybean residue does not tie up a lot of nitrogen during the decomposition process, whereas corn residue the microbes that are breaking down that high carbon corn residue tie up a tremendous amount of nitrogen. So that's why we should call it a corn on corn penalty rather than a soybean credit. I'll point out uh, phosphorus. I'll give Dr. Velo credit for this too. Notice that a high percentage of the phosphorus taken up by the plant leaves in the grain. So <clears throat> soybeans do not use near as much phosphorus as corn, but a very high percentage of what they take up uh, is pretty important to that plant because it ends up in the grain. Um, potassium, <clears throat> they take up a tremendous amount of potassium. Quite a bit of it leaves the field. So if you look at, um, you know, for example, on this uh, phosphorus here, so we needed 196 pounds of that for our corn. Adam, what is uh, 44 divided by 0.46? About 100-ish, probably. 95.6. 96. So that would be what? Uh, 292? So, <clears throat> so, so you're 200, 200 that, you know, there's, there's a lot of people that think they're doing a good job managing fertility would be putting a 200, 200 spread on, um, you know, might need to be closer to a 300 than a 200 to just put back what you're removing with a 260 bushel corn crop and a 75 bushel soybean crop. That doesn't count any potential buildup that you might need if that's a low testing area of your field and you think the soil test level might be holding that crop back. So I, I know it's you know uncomfortable to think about more fertilizer when we've got fertilizer prices where we're at today, uh, but just wanted to share the amount of nutrient that it takes to produce these high yields. And, and if you want to talk to anybody that's winning yield contest, nobody's doing it by skimping on fertilizer. So, you know, we don't necessarily, um, you know, think that we're going to, we're going to get more efficient with fertility because as yields get higher, the plant gets more efficient. So we will be more efficient with our fertilizer use, but that doesn't mean we're going to use less. You might get the same year or the a higher yield with the same amount, or an even higher yield yet, if you push those, uh, you know, those levels higher, uh, we'll, we'll increase efficiency with fertilizer, but we're probably not going to have a lesser need for fertilizer. Uh, 
Uh, we talked about sulfur already. We talked about zinc and boron. So I just want to share that real quick just to show you what the soybean numbers look like, show you that nitrogen number especially. That, that's one of the reasons why a lot of people have felt that there, there has to be a way to increase soybean yield by feeding them nitrogen. Um, that's been difficult to do. Nitrogen responses in soybeans are very inconsistent. So <clears throat> even though the crop cannot fix that much nitrogen on its own, the amount that it can fix and the amount that naturally exists in our high organic matter soils is, is typically enough to support at least up to 75 bushel of beans. When you get higher than that, it's difficult for the plant to capture and make enough nitrogen to feed itself. So at really, really high yield levels, in theory, there should be an advantage to, to giving soybeans nitrogen. But again, it's, it's been pretty inconsistent and uh, not really a, a standard practice that, uh, that we recommend. Also pretty, uh, <clears throat> I would say, environmentally unacceptable to, uh, in the minds of most people, to put nitrogen on a legume that is, in theory, making its own nitrogen. <clears throat> so with that, uh, is, is there any other questions come in, Adam, on fertility-related stuff? Not at the moment. Okay. <clears throat> so we're going to shift gears a little bit. I want to touch on, um, on a little bit on fungicide. And, and this is really to address a question that none of you asked. This is a question that came up with a group of seed production growers that I was with this week. Great uh, two days of great meetings. Uh, nice to be back in a room full of people, uh, having a, a real meeting with our uh, seed corn growers out of Aureliopolis production plant. A lot of those guys have irrigation, obviously a lot of irrigation involved in seed corn production. And so the question came up about what about putting on fungicide through irrigation? And, and that's a practice that, <clears throat> that I don't have a lot of personal experience with, I'll be honest with you. Uh, some growers that I work with have taught me that it works a lot better than I would have thought that it would. I do think that there are some things that, um, that you need to be able to do to be successful with it. You, you need to have a system that you can run at basically 100%, move that pivot around really fast put on as little moisture as possible. So if you can get below three tenths of an inch of, of moisture, that, that's, that's where I would like to see it. Um, those, uh, you know, the, the labels on products need to be consulted closely. You need to have the right pumps and check valves and, and systems in your, in your pivot system uh, to, to apply those products accurately and safely. So you got to be able to meter it. You got to be able to pump it. You got to be able to store it. You got to make sure it's not getting in your well and contaminating, going places it's not supposed to be. So, so if you want to dabble with fungicide through a pivot, be sure to consult the label on the product that you use. I consulted our product labels and all three of our fungicides commonly used in this area, Stratego Yield, Delaro, and Delaro Complete are all labeled to be used through various different irrigation systems. So <clears throat> if you've got the ability to, to apply a fungicide through irrigation, that is an effective way to do it. Um, you know, you don't necessarily want to pour on so much water that it's running off the leaves. So you need to be able to get your, your application volume of water down pretty low <clears throat> so that you're, you're not really irrigating while you do that. <clears throat> Excuse me, a little frog this morning. You're not really irrigating so much when you do that. You're just using the irrigator as a means of application. And uh, you do get extremely good coverage. And, and we have noticed, uh, learned the hard way, that uh, tar spot pressure is intense in irrigated corn acres. So if you are farming irrigated corn acres, I, I, would, I would strongly encourage you to consider multiple applications of a fungicide through the growing season. And maybe one or more of those applications you might be able to make through your center pivot irrigation since it's there and, it, and it's available to you. So I just wanted to follow up on that because we had a good question at a meeting. And uh, I, I, I pride myself on being able to answer any question on the spot, Adam. But uh, I, I honestly did not know if all of our fungicide products were labeled for uh, application through irrigation. Um, I think most fungicide products are. All three of ours are. And um, <clears throat> that's something you'd want to, you know, for sure consult the label. There's a fairly long section in a fungicide label that talks about application through irrigation. And there's a lot of 
fairly specific um, recommendations and procedures that you need to follow. And, and you need to be sure that, you know, you got the proper check valves and stuff. You, you don't want those pesticides uh, ending up in your well or, um, or in any sort of um, uh, irrigation ditch or any place uh, other than on the crop. So with that, um, anything come in on the chat, Adam? So, uh, you know, we've been talking a lot about a lot of factors influencing corn yield, talk about how corn yield before on acid agronomists, it's a system approach, right? Right. And we've been touching on a couple of big components of the system, population we've talked about. Right. We've talked about nutrients in particular, uh, you know, removal of certain nutrients. Mm -hmm. So this all's got me thinking, of, and then you're talking about fungicides. So it's right. also got me thinking about higher yield, pushing yields in corn. Right. And it might be a good opportunity for some of our listeners and some of the people that work with us to remind them or to let them know that we've got a yield chasers competition. Oh, right. That uh, we we love to be a part of the conversation and part of the process. We enjoy right. doing that with people. So get a hold of Lance, get a hold of your rep, or if you've got a different TA, uh, Chris Callow would be the other TA yeah. on our on our team. Uh, get a hold of us. We'd love to talk to you about trying to look at a field mm -hmm. or two to maybe talk about pushing those populations and what it takes to support those populations. Right. So, no, absolutely. Good. Uh, good. Good reminder. That's uh, something that so, some of our neighboring teams have have well established yield chaser uh, yield contest programs. Southern Illinois, in particular, has been running a, a great program. We we've really you know been a little bit. Uh, uh, a little bit behind in getting that established in our area, but I know we have a lot of growers that like to push for higher yields and it's fun to, to get involved in some of those contests and, and uh, learn from what other growers are doing. So good, uh, good, good call out, Adam. And, um, you know, if you're trying to find a, uh, if you're trying to find a good, uh, good agronomist, uh, you, you can always call Cal Al, uh, even if you're in my area. So, uh, so Chris and I cover, uh, cover our team and enjoy working together. So, so I wanted to uh, touch on uh, Eric, a little bit of Eric's question and, and related to spend a little bit of time. I'll, I'll get up on a, on a little bit of a soapbox here on, on replanting and, and planting decisions. And uh, between, you know, I know on, on my farm, between my crop hail policy, my federal crop policy and the generous replant policies of a lot of seed companies, um, you can almost seemingly make money by replanting. Uh, these days. And, and I think that makes us a little maybe more cavalier than we should be. Sometimes when it comes to putting a crop in the ground, we figure, well, hell, I got, I got insurance. If, uh, if it doesn't work out, I'll, I'll do it again. I, I personally hate replanting. I, you know, I don't ever want to have a replant claim. It's, it's just, uh, it's, it's frustrating. I, I feel like a failure if I have to replant something. Um, and it just, it sucks trying to make that decision of, you know, do I replant this or do I not? And if you got a half a stand, what do you do with that? And, I, and I'm a no-till guy and I, I preach all the time that, you know, you can't plant into half a stand. You know, people do it all the time, but, you know, if, if you don't want to get the field cultivator or the soil finisher out, what are you going to do? So, so replant's always a, a frustrating and, and even though you're getting well paid, uh, by crop insurance and probably getting free or or steeply discounted seed uh, from your seed supplier, still not an ideal situation. And and then this year uh, and, and other years in the past, this has been the case as well. Seed supplies are very tight, so a lot of products are essentially sold out. And and if there's widespread replanting, uh, the options that you have for replanting. Are not going to be the product you bought in the first case, and in, and in some cases will be an inferior product to the product that you bought in the first case. So so you may get paid by crop insurance to do it. You may get free seed from us to do it, uh, but you're probably not going to get the same product you had the first time. So if you really 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 want to raise a crop with the seed products that you have in your warehouse, in many cases we we got one shot to do that right. And, and I know looking at the weather forecast and looking at the fields and looking at the poor calves at my farm standing out in the, the water drove, drenched in, in, uh, in rain that, you know, you start to worry, well, when, when am I going to be able to get the crop in? It's, you know, it's not even April yet. I was joking with Adam last night. Should we, should we be talking about uh, switching to earlier RM hybrids yet? And uh, he, he told me he'd, he'd pull the plug on the, on the program if I brought that up. So, so you, you guys, uh, you guys all get to, uh, I'll get pretty anxious this time of year and, you know, years like 2019 are a good reminder that, you know, planting date is important, but what happens through the growing season is a lot more important than the planting date. 
Um, you know, planting date is arguably more important in soybeans than it is in corn. Um, but, you know, you, you could, you know, we got a lot of time to get the crop in the ground, raise a good crop. So uh, let, let's let it be fit. Uh, let's do it right. Um, you know, Eric asked the question uh, about imbibitional chilling. So imbibitional, that sounded almost dirty the way that I said it. Um, you know, imbibitional chilling is just when that seed takes in its first drink of water. And that water is below about 38 degrees is the temperature that we think imbibitional chilling really occurs at. So it's got to be pretty cold soil conditions. It's got to be well colder than, you know, we talk about that 50 degree soil temperature that, you know, doesn't mean as much to people as it used to. But, you know, imbibitional chilling is not going to occur in a 48 degree soil. Um, growth is slow in a 48 degree soil but damage is not occurring in a 48 degree soil. Now, if it gets, you know, if that, if that first water, you know, in some cases, the soil might be say 45, but if there's a 28 degree rain falling in the field and that cold water is soaking into the soil and that seed has been setting in a relatively dry soil and the first water, first drink of water that that seed takes up, is really, really chilled and cold. Now, the, the, the rain is going to get warmed by the soil. So eventually, the water, you know, the water temperature in the soil is the same as the soil temperature. Um, so that reaches an equilibrium. But if you've got a cold rain falling and, and that cold water is soaking into that relatively dry soil and that seed has only been in the ground for, say, 24, 36 hours or less, and it has not really kicked off the germination process yet. And that first drink of water that that seedling take that seed takes in is really, really chilled. That's when that chilling injury can occur. And what that does is it's a it's a stress on the seed. It doesn't kill the germ, but it stresses the seed. It weakens the seed. It weakens the germ. It slows the germ. It basically steals that plant of its vigor. Is is the way I would say it. So it turns a it, it turns a high quality seed into a marginal quality seed, and it turns a marginal quality quality seed into probably a seed that doesn't um, doesn't emerge from the soil. And so we get uneven emergence, we get poor emergence, and so <clears throat> that's what we talk about when we talk about it, uh, talk about imbibitional chilling. And that's why you'll hear some agronomists say, "Hey, there's a you know bad weather coming. You need to park the planter 48 hours ahead of the bad weather." That's really hard to do, right? I I don't know that I've ever told a guy to quit planting. You know, I've told some guys not to start planting. Um, but you know, when when you're rolling, it's it's really hard to quit. You know, the, the weather forecast is right what half the time, and and about the time you park the planter because there's a big cold rain coming and then it ends up being 10 degrees warmer than the forecast said, or we get three tenths of rain instead of three inches of rain, you know, three tenths of rain is not going to hurt anything. I don't, I don't care how cold the rain is, but if you get three inches of cold rain and it's a prolonged wet saturated period, and I'm always going to argue that especially in central Illinois, this is probably not the case everywhere in the corn belt, but in central Illinois, we lose more stand. We lose more plants. We have more issues because of suffocation than we do because of temperature. So it's not as much the temperature as it is the combination of wet saturated soils and cold. So wet saturated soils will kill a plant faster if it's warm. So you remember back the last two years, two years or three years, how, how many, years, how many Mother's Day weekends have we had in a row that were bad at? It's, at it's been at least two. It, yeah, it, it feels may, like three. May, but... It might have been three in some areas. So so we've had some really, really tough conditions in early May, the last, at least the last two years. Maybe some people would say going back three years. Mm -hmm. and, and, and some of that is due to temperature, but it's more due to moisture. And when you get wet, saturated soil conditions, this is a big advantage soybeans have over corn. Corn, corn does not hold its breath very well at all. It can hold its breath longer in a cold soil than it can in a warm soil. But soybeans are, are much better at standing, standing those anaerobic uh, conditions. And, and that's why we typically will see better stand establishment from soybeans going through a prolonged cold wet period than, than we do corn. So I, I guess what I would say is when you're trying to make that decision when you go to the field, don't pay as much attention to the calendar date as you do the field conditions. It, it is good to look at the weather forecast. 
And ideally, you know, we plant in a in good soil conditions with a favorable forecast coming. Um, you know, planting in good soil conditions with a horrible forecast coming, in my opinion, is gen you know generally you get away with that. That's not an ideal situation, but generally you get away with that. What I really hate to see a guy do is plant in the marginal conditions with a horrible forecast coming. Uh, so that that's a little bit too much of a bad situation. Um, you know, ideal would be good soil conditions, good forecast. Acceptable would be good soil conditions and sketchy forecast. Um, you know, unacceptable would be poor soil conditions with a sketchy forecast. So those would kind of be the, the three scenarios. So um, just just be uh, just be cognizant of that. That uh, re replant seed might be you know might the selection might be a bit scarce. Uh, there is plenty of seed to replant. It just won't be in some cases the hybrid you bought the first time. So um, you've gone to a lot of work to pick your hybrids. You've gone to a lot of work in some cases to position those hybrids by field. Just recognize if you have to do it again, you know, that plan is going to kind of get thrown out the window. And so uh, hopefully we don't have a lot of replant this year. And uh, that, that's our hope every year, but uh, a little more so this year than, than maybe a, a normal year. Anything else you want to add to that, Adam? No, I, I think you hit it on the head. And uh, I understand that there's a lot to get done in the spring and you're trying to get it done as efficiently and quickly as you can. I, I would definitely lean on your soybean app. You know, if you're gonna if you're gonna plant in those situations where you got some marginal field yeah. conditions and <clears throat> marginal outlook from a weather perspective, right. right? I would definitely hedge my bets towards the soybean side. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the one of the best farms beans I raised last year. Uh, I planted on a. I was glad I had a cab the day I was planting that field because uh, if 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 I'd have been on a non-cab tractor, I would not have been planting. It was spitting snow. It was nasty. There was freezing temperatures in the forecast. Um, it was it was really you know damp, you know dreary. Not a not a nice day at all. Soil conditions were fine because it had been dry leading up to that. The weather forecast was horrible. I, I had a day that I could do some planting. This this farm was the soil was fit to plant on that day. Um, stand was great. Beans were great, you know, worked out just fine. Some of the beans I had planted in better conditions 10 days earlier than that got nipped by some freezing temperatures after they came up and, and actually struggled a, a little bit more. So it's really hard to predict. And this is, this is part of why as an agronomist, I, I, I have a hard time second guessing mother nature. Um, I, I don't know what the best days to plant are. I don't know what the worst days are to plant until after we've done it. And, and every time you start saying that, well, I shouldn't plant this day, you know, that, that's a risk to not plant that day. It's a risk to plant that day. So you have to decide for yourself, what's the greater risk? Is the greater risk not getting anything done? Or is the greater risk maybe putting some stuff in the ground and in, in some some challenging conditions and and maybe risking you know replant? Um, you know, a lot of people conventional wisdom would say that you know early planted is is riskier. Well, that's not always the case. Our our worst replant situations the last two years have been from May planted crops. Um, you know, I was not a big fan of planting corn on Easter weekend a year ago. And although that stuff got ravaged by crown rot and didn't end up being the best corn, the stands were fine. Now, it took a while to come up. It went through hell coming up. That's part of why the crown rot was so bad. But if you just looked at it from a stand establishment standpoint, there, there was, you know, Easter, Easter Sunday corn was way better than Mother's Day corn. Um, so you, you can't look at the calendar and, and know that this is a good time or a bad time to do anything because so much depends on what happens the week after you put it in the ground. Um, the week after you put it in the ground is, is probably the most going to make the biggest determination of how good is that stand uh, based on what kind of a start does that seed get off to. And that goes for corn and beans, both, but especially corn. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. It, it's uh Corn, and really, it's the it's the ability. I, I think the difference is corn does not have the ability to survive for a prolonged period of time in a soggy, wet, anaerobic, saturated soil condition. Soybeans can. Um, you you can have a soybean in borderline soup for two or three weeks, and and it'll come up just fine once soil. It it will not come up in those conditions, but it will remain viable 
And then when you know nothing grows in a saturated soil. So it's not that the soybean is growing in those soil conditions, but it does have a better ability to survive in those soil conditions. And then when soil conditions improve, it will grow. Whereas the corn seed dies in those bad soil conditions. And then as soil conditions improve, that's when you realize, oh crap, it's not coming up. I, I got a problem. No, I think that's all good advice. And, uh, you know, the next Ask the Agronomist is on April 7th. So between now and April 7th, if yeah. it dries up, there could absolutely be a lot of activity, a lot of action going yeah. on out there. Yeah. Um, we got just about 11, 10 or 11 minutes left here. So I would just like to say again, um, remind you about the yield chasers thing that we're doing here in the West Central Illinois team. Talk to your TA, talk to your rep, talk to your dealer. Uh, we'd all have fun trying to have some fun yeah. going higher yields on those types of acres. Uh, if you like these YouTube videos, this Astro Agronomist segments that we do, I think they're great information. You can always go back and look at them on, on YouTube and watch them over. So give us a like yeah. if you like those. Uh, subscribe, hit the notification bell so you know when they're popping up. We try to do them every two weeks, as, as our patrons know. And, uh, you know, tell somebody about it because we really like to have a conversation. Lance and I both, Lance especially, yeah. obviously, being the guy talking it's great to have a conversation instead of just uh, spewing information right. out randomly. Right. Um, I would say the only other thing that I, I maybe would like to just hit on a little bit, because we might have some planning between now and the next right. Ask the Agronomist, touch just slightly on planning depth. maybe. Sure. A bit. Yep, we'll do. And before I get into that, I did think of one thing I wanted to shout out. So I want to give a, a shout out to our, uh, uh, our contest winner from last year. So if you remember our final episode from 2021, uh, we gave away six bags of uh, of a highly sought after. Would that be a fair statement, Adam? That was a very, uh, very fair statement. <laughs> DeKalb Hybrid, uh, DKC 6595, one of, one of my personal favorites in our top volume hybrid. So uh, Lance Lovelace, so another another Lance, a uh, lot, lot of Lances involved with Ask the Agronomist, uh, was, our, was our grand prize winner last year. So if you remember, everybody who had asked a question live on Ask the Agronomist was entered and and for every you know if you asked 10 questions you had 10 entries in the pot and so everybody who had asked questions on the live chat was entered into that drawing for that six bags of corn and I got a chance to meet Lance for the first time yesterday and uh, deliver that seed to him uh, he, he farms south of Jacksonville Illinois and, and has been a, a loyal listener follower and question asker on Ask the Agronomist so I love my question askers and uh, hopefully we will uh, we will be able to do something like that again um, uh, later at the maybe towards the tail end. That was that was like our Christmas uh, Christmas episode. Yes. <clears throat> so planning depth. So I'm gonna draw my soil line. I'm gonna draw my corn plant, and then we're gonna draw our corn plants root system. So here's your seed right here at this level that would be your planting depth so so here would be your seed your seed roots your, your radical root the first root to emerge from the seed that's the oldest part of the corn plant you can you know a little little, little bit of trivia the dyes and color that's in seed treatment it's amazing how long that stuff lasts and it's amazing how long that dyed seed coat lasts you can oftentimes at harvest still find the green seed coat or remnants of the green seed coat in that root system. So, <clears throat> so you know, we dye our seed green, other seeds pink. There's, there's different companies use different colors. Sometimes you can even still tell the difference between the purple refuge seed and the green, you know, non-refuge seed in, in the bag. But uh, so, so where that seed is placed has an impact on, on root development and it especially has an impact on these nodal roots. So the seed roots, I think, end up being less than 5% of the root mass of the hybrid. The nodal roots, which, which begin forming right here, there's several nodes of nodal roots. Over time, these nodal roots become 95% plus of, of the root mass of the hybrid. And the seed root system, which is critical for supporting that plant, the seed and seed root system, up to about V3. So by the time the plants reach V3, you know, these nodal roots have kind of taken over. And if you took that seed root system away from that plant after V3, 
it would hardly even notice you did anything to it. If you take that seed root system away from that plant before V3, it's going to turn into a runt that's going to really struggle. And typically what takes that seed root system away from the plant is a pathogen that kills this mesocotyl here, which is what's conveying nutrients from the seed and the seed roots up into the plant. And I'm going <clears> to <throat> start this over again so you can see what I'm looking at here. <clears throat> so the reason we talk about planting death being important is because of that Nova root system. So, so we generally <clears throat> recommend a two inch planting depth. Um, 1.5 is a minimum, not ideal. Up to, I'm going to say 2.5. <clears throat> two inches would be optimum. I'd rather be at two and a half than one and a half. So, so I try not to be under two, definitely do not want to be under an inch and a half because wherever that seed is and wherever the soil surface is, your nova roots are going to start to form about halfway between the seed and the soil surface. You do not want your nova roots trying to grow shallower than one inch. So if your nova roots are trying to grow shallower than one inch, that's putting them too close to the surface. And if that soil is dry down to an inch and a half, those nodal roots are not going to form properly. If that seed trench opens back up and those nodal roots are trying to grow into air because the seed trench splits back open. So seed to soil contact is very important, but keeping that seed trench closed all the way to the surface is important as well. And that's why there's numerous different press wheel planter attachments and drag chains and all that stuff to try to crumble that seed ball back together and keep that furrow from splitting back open. And, and that's a good answer to your question, Merle. Merle Bedell just shot a question in and says, do you measure the top of the seed or the bottom of the trench? Well, I, I, I would typically say basically from where, you know, you're, you're wanting to know where the seed is at in relation yeah. to the surface of the soil. So, Hopefully the seed is towards the bottom. That's of the trench, right. That's right. You know, which, good. which, 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 uh, you know, directly. Let, let, let me draw. I'll draw a quick picture for for Merrill's question. So, so I'm going to draw a big seed trench here, and I'm going to draw a seed that gets caught on the edges, and then I'm going to draw another one here where the seed gets smashed right down on the bottom, maybe with a seed for uh, with a seed firmer or something. So, so let's say here's your soil surface, and let's say this is two inches. This is also two inches to the bottom of the trench, but the seeds hung up up here at say an inch and a half. So, so this right here is the enemy. You do not want an air pocket underneath your seed. You want that seed smashed right down on the bottom of that trench. And then you want to crumble both of these walls. You want to cave all this back in and you don't want that opening back up. This air pocket down here can really, really, really mess with your germination because you don't have seed to soil contact here. You've got seed to air pocket contact here. So, so you really want, you know, I don't care too much whether, because the difference between the top of the seed and the bottom of the trench in this one is an insignificant amount of difference. Over here, it's a big problem. And, and it's not so much, you know, and you'd be better off. So let's say that seed's in an inch and a half. It should have been at two inches and there's a half inch air pocket down here. If you would have planted an inch and a half deep and your seed trench was only an inch and a half deep and it's still in the bottom of the seed trench an inch and a half deep, I would say that's not ideal because that's too shallow. But you're better off being at the bottom of the seed trench always, you know, even if your seed trench is too shallow versus being stuck you know, suspended in midair and you don't get pushed down into the bottom of the seed trench. So that, that's the, that's the rationale behind firmers and what firmers are supposed to do is make sure that seed is in the bottom of the trench. The bottom of your trench might be two and a half inches. The bottom of your trench might be an inch and a half. The bottom of your trench might be, I don't know what, but wherever it is, that's where you want the seed. Yeah, seed firmers are, are great for helping with that problem. And also planting in dry soils is very, very important for trying to alleviate that problem. I've, I've seen in wet soil conditions where things have been planted before, sometimes out of necessity, you know, not because the guy necessarily wants to, I'm not saying everybody's doing everything wrong, but 
you know, if you got wet soils, they don't tend to crumble and right. collapse and you don't get things positioned as well when you got wet soil conditions. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm a big two inch planting depth um, guy. I, you know, I, I talk with growers every year that, you know, if it's, uh, if it's early and it's cold or the weather forecast is less than perfect, the temptation is to plant it shallower to get it up faster. And, and when it's, when it's wet or at least moist, shallow planting doesn't hurt as bad as, as when it's dry, but shallow planting results in rootless corn uh, and, and you're in and you're out. I walk a lot more fields that have stand establishment issues because they were planted too shallow than because they were planted too deep. Um, you know, and, and what I tell guys is if, if, if you are so uncomfortable with the field conditions and the weather forecast that you're not willing to plant two inches deep, that is a really good indication that you should not be planting. So, so I, I'd stick to that two inch depth and, and if to be at two inches, you end up being at two and a half, that's fine. Um, the guys that are shooting for an inch and a half are ending up with stuff that's three quarters of an inch deep. And, and those seeds, you know, just do not develop the root mass, uh, do not, a lot of times they do not come up as early as you would think because they might lay in some dry soil, might not have good seed to soil contact. So, um, so two, two inch planting depth is a, is a good place to be. If you're a little less or a little more than that, not a problem, but, um, you know, we just, we just don't want to be too shallow. There's a, there's a lot more susceptibility to, to variation, environmental pests, um, animals well, well, the, at, the, at a shallow depth the, versus the two inch. The, the imbibitional chilling thing can come into effect yeah. too, because that, you know, if you got a seed that's an inch deep, that seed that's an inch deep is a lot closer to the atmosphere uh, than a seed that's two inches deep. So, so if you looked at soil temperature, fluctuates way more at an inch deep than it does at two inches deep. And it fluctuates more at two inches deep than it does at four inches deep. Um, so, so yeah, there's, there's just numerous reasons why, uh, you know, I, you know, I try to keep my planting depth up just to keep the ground squirrels from digging the seed up, but they can, they can still get to it. So I can't, I can't get it deep enough to keep them from carrying it off. But, um, but anyway, two, two inches is where you want to be or something close to that. Appreciate the question, Merrill. And, uh, thanks to everybody for your questions. It's been a great, uh, great episode for questions today. I, I always feel better when I get lots of questions. I, I don't know. I don't know if it's any better for you guys or not, but it makes me feel better. So I appreciate that. And if you have questions that you didn't ask live, you know, send me an email, give me a call, get a hold of your FSR. Mo most episodes, there's, there's two or three questions that come in after we're done that uh, I use for, you know, feed, feed and fodder for the following, uh, uh, following episode. So we'll be back with you. Would you say April, April, 7th. 7th. April 7th, maybe we'll be busy planting. Don't know, but uh, we'll be back with you April 7th on Ask the Agronomist. Everybody stay safe and uh, thanks for joining.